On a clear day in April 1970, the Kennedy Space Center in America was alive with excitement. A formidable rocket, bearing the Apollo 13 insignia, roared to life, setting the stage for a new chapter in humanity's quest for the moon. Inside were astronauts James A. Lovell Jr., John L. Swigert Jr., and Fred W. Hayes Jr. Interestingly, they weren't the mission's original crew, but were called upon to replace the initial team due to unforeseen circumstances. Poised for their own moonwalk, these three were inspired by Neil Armstrong's iconic lunar steps just months earlier, a significant milestone in the fervor of the space race. The success stories of Apollo 11 and 12, key milestones in this competitive journey, were still fresh, fueling the confidence of this new crew. For them, the moon wasn't just a celestial body, it was a dream waiting to be realized. However, the universe, in its unpredictability, had different plans. As they ventured deep into space, about 330,000 kilometers away from home, an alarming jolt shook their spacecraft. The quiet of space was shattered by loud alarms, and a sea of warning lights painted a grim picture of impending disaster. A vital oxygen tank had exploded, and its companion tank was failing fast. Ground control scrambled, initially suspecting faulty readings, but the grim reality became evident as the astronauts reported seeing their life-sustaining air escaping into the vast void. The blast had thrust them off course, sending them drifting further from Earth than anyone had ever been. Within hours, these three men set an unintentional record. They were the farthest humans from our blue planet. The mission, which began as a hopeful journey to the moon, now hung in the balance. The primary objective was no longer about moon landings, but a more urgent and dire matter. Would they ever see home again? This heart-wrenching saga was Apollo 13's story, a mission that swiftly descended into what many consider the space race's most significant disaster. The backdrop to this was President John F. Kennedy's ambitious declaration in 1961. To achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. By 1969, the promise seemed to be taking form. Missions Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 not only succeeded in taking astronauts to the moon, but also ensured their safe return. This realization of Kennedy's vision came with a surprising aftermath. The euphoria of the first man on the moon gradually began to fade. Understandably, the second, third, and even fourth instances couldn't replicate the initial excitement causing public interest and subsequently government funding to wane during this peak era of the space race. In response to declining enthusiasm and budget cuts, several future endeavors, including missions like Apollo 20, were shelved. Amidst this challenging backdrop, Apollo 13 wasn't just another mission, it held the weighty responsibility of rekindling the world's interest in the ongoing space race. Beyond merely stepping on the moon, NASA aimed to show its commitment to understanding the lunar environment, hoping that one day humans might sustainably work and perhaps even live there, ensuring that the trials and triumphs of the space race would not end in disaster. During the first two days, there were no problems in the mission. At 46 hours, 43 minutes into the journey, the capsule communicator on duty calmly reported that the spacecraft was in good shape and the crew was essentially just sitting there, boredom setting in. The smoothness of operations had created an unexpected lull, so much so that a sense of monotony had settled in. Uh oh, have you guys completed your income tax? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I gotta. It, that it, it's funny. It's Apollo Control at 46 hours 43 minutes. Scratch in real good shape as far as we're concerned, Jim. We're bored to tears. The mission entered its third day, the 13th of April. On this day, the crew received instructions for some tests on the lunar module a routine task in the grand scheme of their mission. Additionally, they were tasked with conducting a broadcast for television, an attempt to share the interiors of the command module and service module with the world. However, the public's interest was so minimal that television networks chose not to air this broadcast in real time. Even Commander Lovell's wife, present in the VIP section of Mission Control, found herself in a sparse audience. About six and a half minutes after the conclusion of this somewhat overlooked TV broadcast, the course of events took a dramatic turn. Flight controllers on the ground prompted astronaut Swigert to perform a routine check of the oxygen levels in the service module, an ordinary procedure. In a sudden and terrifying instant, an enormous explosion rocked the spacecraft. A cacophony of warning lights and alarms erupted, plunging the astronauts into a state of shock. Commander Lovell, in an urgent exchange with Mission Control, delivered the now famous words, Hey, we really got a problem here. The reality became evident. One oxygen tank was fully depleted and the other was rapidly losing its vital contents. At first, Mission Control entertained the notion that instruments might be displaying erroneous data, 
but the magnitude of the situation soon became undeniable. The television channels that had previously dismissed the mission as uneventful and thus avoided covering it were now compelled to make it the headline. At the moment, the astronauts are continuing to try to isolate their trouble. A late report says the spacecraft now is operating on battery power alone. All unnecessary equipment is being turned off. The trajectory of public interest had shifted drastically, capturing the world's attention with an unforeseen crisis that demanded immediate action to save the lives of the astronauts. The spacecraft's oxygen tanks, spherical in design, stored oxygen in its liquid state. Each tank was equipped with a heater, ensuring the liquid oxygen's conversion into gas, vital for the astronauts' survival. Intriguingly, the tank labeled Number 2 had an eventful past. Initially meant for Apollo 10, it was removed for modifications and in the process suffered a mishap. A seemingly innocuous fall during repairs caused internal damage, unnoticed during inspections. When the tanks underwent testing, a peculiar issue emerged. Tank number two wouldn't empty entirely. Engineers resorted to using heaters to evaporate the stubborn oxygen residue. They later discovered a startling oversight. The tank's thermometer was limited to a maximum reading of 30 degrees Celsius. In reality, during the heating process, temperatures soared to a scorching 538 degrees Celsius. Such extreme heating compromised the tank's electrical wiring insulation. Though NASA had greenlighted the tank after thorough assessments, these internal damages escaped their scrutiny. This oversight set the stage for disaster. On the mission's third day, during a routine oxygen check, a spark from the compromised wiring led to a catastrophic explosion. This incident might have turned utterly tragic if the tank had been positioned inside the spacecraft. Thankfully, its external location meant the explosion impacted only a segment of the service module, albeit causing significant damage. Confusion ensued. How extensively was the spacecraft damaged? With their primary mission compromised, the urgent question was, how would they get back home safely? Two options presented themselves. The faster route involved rotating the spacecraft, requiring the potentially damaged service module's main engine. Alternatively, they could embark on a more extended, perilous journey, slingshotting around the moon and back to Earth using the lunar module's engine, which wasn't designed for prolonged usage. Despite the challenges, NASA's flight director opted for the lunar route. A directive was issued, shut down the command service module, CSM, and used the lunar module as a lifeboat. However, this solution came with its own set of problems. The lunar module was equipped for two astronauts for a mere 20 hours, whereas now, three astronauts had to survive in it for potentially four, five days. Moreover, firing the lunar module's engine repeatedly was risky, given its design limitations. To maximize their chances of survival, non-essential systems, including heaters, were powered down to conserve energy. Adhering to this plan, the astronauts initiated the lunar module's engines, a process known as a burn, to chart a new trajectory. This adjustment set them on a course around the moon's far side. This unexpected journey saw them set a new record, becoming the farthest humans from Earth at a staggering 400,000 kilometers distance. While this path promised Earth's return in about 153 hours post-launch, it came with razor-thin margins. This timeline left a mere hour's surplus of essential supplies. NASA's ground team deemed this too narrow a margin, consequently astronauts were instructed to initiate a second burn of the lunar module's engines, making their journey home even more precarious. In the high-stakes environment of space, every single action holds tremendous weight, and the intricacies of engineering and quick problem-solving can determine life or death. At Mission Control, engineers backed by their profound knowledge and experience ran calculations at a frantic pace. Their objective was to ascertain if the lunar module engine could handle another burn a maneuver that wasn't in the original playbook. Their analysis paid off. Upon executing the second burn, the initial flight time of 153 hours was slashed to 143, granting the astronauts an 11-hour breathing room. But as the astronauts dared to breathe a sigh of relief, a fresh challenge loomed. Escalating levels of carbon dioxide within the spacecraft. Canisters of lithium hydroxide, vital for absorbing exhaled carbon dioxide and converting it into lithium carbonate, were running low. The lunar module, designed for two astronauts over a two-day span, was now grappling with the respiratory needs of three men over four days. Although the command module did house additional canisters, they were incompatible due to their square shape, as opposed to the lunar module's circular canisters. With the clock ticking and under 24 hours to devise a solution, the ground crew and astronauts engaged in a real-time brainstorming session. Taking stock of onboard items like plastic bags, cardboard, suit hoses, and duct tape, they endeavored to craft an impromptu device. 
Their ingenuity culminated in a makeshift carbon dioxide filtration system. While lacking in aesthetics, it effectively reduced the CO2 levels. As Commander Lovell later remarked in his book, Lost Moon, the contraption wasn't very handsome, but it worked. This incredible feat of problem-solving was one among many during this fraught mission. Meticulous attention was given to every detail, however small. In a bid to maintain the spacecraft's trajectory, astronauts were cautioned to limit their water consumption to 200 milliliters daily. Greater intake would lead to more frequent urination, potentially altering the ship's course. This stringent rationing combined with the stress and physical rigors of the mission resulted in a collective weight loss of 14 kilograms among the three astronauts, and health problems did not spare them. Astronaut Hayes succumbed to a urinary tract infection. Days turned into what seemed like an eternity. As Apollo 13 neared Earth, another miscalculation surfaced. Cooling vapor present within the spacecraft had inadvertently altered their trajectory. With unflinching resolve, Commander Lovell executed yet another lunar module burn, nudging the vessel back on course. It was a testament to both human and machine endurance that this lunar module, designed for a single burn, had successfully withstood three. Back on Earth, global audiences were riveted to their screens, their collective breaths held, as Apollo 13's saga unfolded in real time. The re-entry of a spacecraft into Earth's atmosphere is a moment of both culmination and trepidation. The command module was the lone part of the Apollo 13 vessel designed to endure the fiery trial of re-entry, compelling the astronauts to shift back into it. As the module made its descent, a thick silence enveloped the communication channels. A phenomenon known as ionization, where radio waves are disrupted by heated air, was anticipated, but the blackout stretched longer than the expected three minutes, turning seconds into agonizing eons. Four minutes in, and Mission Control, as well as the global audience, grew more anxious. Had something gone wrong? Had the compromised mission met an unfortunate end? But after a harrowing four minutes and 27 seconds, communications crackled back to life, a testament to the resilience of both man and machine. The world exhaled collectively as the trio of astronauts were safely cradled by the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, their parachutes billowing like protective guardian angels. One of the astronauts later reflected, teamwork was essential. Effective leadership and the ability to think innovatively on the fly played crucial roles. We learned that when adversity strikes, how you respond determines the outcome. The mission might have failed its primary goal of lunar landing, but Apollo 13 etched its name in the annals of history as a beacon of human courage, ingenuity, and sheer will. Its story captivated many, leading to a myriad of books and films ensuring that the tale of Apollo 13's near-tragic voyage and triumphant return was immortalized for future generations.